today. Uh, do we have to refer to you as Mr. White? Uh, your CEO, not president. Uh, do we have to change that up? No. It's all the same shit. <laughs> uh, amazing night. I think you said best of the season. I mean, just give us your overall thoughts. It did seem like just every fight was incredible tonight. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that uh, the first fight of the night set the tone. You know, when you see a fight like that and you're in the back watching, you're like, oh, shit. You know what I mean? That's why to be the main event, guys, a lot, ton of pressure. I mean, every fight tonight was awesome. Um, yeah, I, I just I don't even know what to say other than it was an amazing day. You mentioned it, the main event, uh, Jaime. Like you said, it was impossible to live up to everything that was there. And giving him a contract, I mean, did you have any concerns or, or did you say, yeah, the, the guy deserves it? It was almost just like, how do I turn anybody down tonight? No, no, it's, it's not. Listen, I'll turn people down in a minute. I think that this kid is 24 years old. He obviously looked like the more experienced fighter, um, fought a tough, durable kid, and uh, looked good everywhere he went. You know what I mean? A couple of times I thought he had him hurt, and – you know, went to the ground with him, and I was like, oh, he's going to, but he beat the shit out of him on the ground. I mean, he, he literally was trying to finish him the whole time on the ground. Never once did that kid not, not try to finish that fight, and uh, I thought he looked damn good doing it, especially for a kid that's only 24 years old. You, you know how I am with the, with the younger guys. Ah, maybe he needs more experience. I didn't think so. I thought that this kid grinded out a technical, impressive win, and if the, the rest of the show didn't fight like absolute maniacs tonight. That would have been a great fight. It looked more impressive. At yeah. That point. yeah. Does he need to change the tattoo on his neck? Are you going to get him to get yeah. that to a U.S.? You can turn that F into a U. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't take too long. Uh, as you said, uh, Jonathan, uh, Brazilian heavyweight, massive KO. Uh, easy call, right? I mean, yep. Nothing to that. Everything was an easy call tonight. I mean, I, there, was, there was nothing about any performance tonight that didn't make me, you know, and, and, and I, gave, uh, I gave Tanner his win money. Uh, Patricia got her win money. Uh, AJ's getting his win money. Um, you know, I, it was an amazing night. We're in, uh, you mentioned all three of those getting win money. Did you consider any losers getting contracts tonight? Because we were kind of talking about that tonight. Some of those fights were so insane. No, I think that, um, you know, all of these kids are, you know, and this guy, this guy's not a kid. He's 31 years old. This Tanner guy, but he goes out and, you know, he gets another win. Definitely look at this kid in again. He's a kid you would definitely bring in, you know, if somebody fell out or, or something like that. You know what you're going to get with this kid. Tanner wants to win. This guy wants to win. I, I love people that, that show up and show you that they're here to win. You mentioned Jonathan's uh, kickboxing record as well. It seems mm. like a, we're getting a lot of kickboxers coming in lately. Um, do you credit that to Israel Adesanya and the success he had? Or, like, why do you think we're seeing more of these former glory guys or former, you know, that are saying, I want to do MMA now? Money. <laughs> there's, there's money. I mean, if you, if you had to look at Israel Adesanya and say, you know, wow, you know, I've been in kickboxing for however many years and how much money have I made, then you look at Israel. Yeah. Uh, Steven Wynn, you mentioned it, man. The guy was. Uh, Pereira, too. Pereira as well. Yeah. Uh, Steven Wynn looked phenomenal. I mean, it said no-brainer. Um, I want to ask you about the finish there because uh, it was weird. It almost got finished at the end of the first round. Should have been finished at the end of the first round. You think round. so? 100%. That, that kid was hurt. You know what I mean? And, and I, was, uh, I was freaking out a little bit. I was like, come on, ref. Stop this fight, man. It's just, I mean, the kid's face was, if that went a third round, that kid wouldn't have had a face. I mean, it was, it was, it was bad. So I think it was a late stoppage. Um, but I'm glad he stopped it when he did. Nice. Um, just want to ask you a few outside tonight. Obviously, this was amazing. Um, I did, you had a, a, a busy morning as well, right? Mm. So I guess, can you talk about uh, the significance of what happened today, the TKO group officially merging, all that? I mean, from your point of view, what's the significance of this new organization? Yeah, I mean, this, this kind of stuff, I usually just, uh, you know, I'm just going to keep doing what I do, and we're going to do what we do at the UFC. And, and listen, at the end of the day, this, this is like one of the biggest mergers in the history of sports. We've been kicking ass for every, you know, however many years now. The WWE is doing well. And, I mean, I say this to you guys every year, but th this just takes the whole sport and everything to a whole different level. And, uh, you know, I flew out to that thing last night and did it this morning. And, and it was actually really, really cool. It was cool to be a part of. And uh, I I'm excited about the future and what we're going to do. And I always am, regardless. But after this merger, I mean, it, it just, we're so much more powerful than we were yesterday. Yeah. 
I read that Vince had worked into his contract that he's the executive chair until his death, resignation, or incapacity. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Did you get anything worked into your deal? Or? I, I don't give a shit about that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Even the CEO thing, um, it's a lateral move for me. I run everything that happens here. Everything that goes on here, I, I determine. So nothing has changed. It's just three letters instead of, but I'm the CEO and president of the UFC now. Um, but nothing changes. We're just going to continue to to kick ass like we do every single year. And 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 for people, um, you know, that are fighters or media or whoever is, in, this just takes this whole thing to another level and, and and so much bigger and so much more powerful. And when you think about all the things that I want to do before my time is up here, today made that a lot a lot easier and a lot more doable. You know. These PIs that we open, they're not cheap. They're very expensive to run, um, but I believe truly that they are the future of the sport. This is what's gonna make the sport get bigger. Um, and uh, even if you, you, you train at a PI as a kid, we go into Africa, we go into Mexico City, and other places that I wanna do this, and you grow up as a kid training in one of these PIs around the world, you might not become a fighter, but you'll become a trainer, or, you know, you will have something to do with the sport and touch the sport in some way to help it grow. Yeah. You used to never say before my time is up, and now you've started to say that a little bit more. Well, I'm 54 years old. I mean, I never said my time was up when I was 40, and you know what I mean? Uh, when I look at somebody's posts, everybody's talking about how fucking old I look. I am fucking old. That's how this works. I'm, I'm older today than I fucking was yesterday. That's how it works, but I feel like I'm fucking 25 again. You know, I've been taking my health serious. I feel great. And, uh, you know, when, when you start talking about my time is up here, the last 20 years have gone by like this. How fast are the next 20 going to go? You know, so um, there's still a lot of work to do. And, uh, you know, today was, a, today was a really, really big day for the sport. Awesome. Last couple ones for me I wanted to ask you about Australia. Uh, Sean Strickland came in after you did at the post-fight press conference. And he's like, boy, I bet Dana and Hunter are saying, we messed up here. What do we got this guy as a UFC champion? So Sean is obviously an interesting character. It carries yeah. himself in an interesting way. What do you think about him representing the brand and carrying the UFC belt around? Listen, it, it is what it is. Um, you know, we obviously put him in that position, and uh, he went in and delivered and, and won the fight, and he's the champ now. So, um, yeah, you know. We, we knew, it's, you know what you're getting when, when you get him. It's, it's, this is no surprise, no shock. Um, yeah, good for him. He went, you, listen, you could tell that night after that first round, I mean, he would go back to his corner and maybe listen to his corner for 15 seconds, and that was it. He was up and ready to go. He felt it. He, he, he felt he was going to win that night. It was awesome to see his body language. Last thing, you were asked about a rematch. You said, that sounds right, but you got, you know, Drickus out there saying, hey, what about me? You got Hamzat and Costa coming up in Abu Dhabi. You had Jared Cannonier there as a backup. So all those seem like viable options. Are you considering all those, or do you still feel like the fight to make is the rematch? Well, I think if you remember that night, people said, well, what do you think? You think it's a rematch? I said, yeah, the rematch sounds great. Not never did I say, I saw the stupid fucking shit that was written, you know, by all these stupid fucking websites. Um, you know, never once did I say, yes, we're going to fucking do this rematch. I said, yeah, the rematch, not, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. There's obviously lots of options out there, and we'll, we'll see what happens. But yes, I'm still not opposed to an Israel rematch. We'll see how it goes. Hi, Dana. Hey. Um, I want to ask a little bit. I know the narrative with Sean is always like, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? But when he won the title, his post-fight speech was very moving, very inspirational. Is there a side of Sean that we aren't seeing and maybe we're starting to see? I agree. I, th I think that, um, you know, two weeks before that, we were in Boston. And I asked the media, there were 70 media members at the, at the press conference, how many people thought that was going to be the outcome? And one guy raised his hand out of 70 media. If I had done that in Australia, nobody would raise their hand, and if they did, they'd be lying. So I think that going into that fight, Strickland knew he was a huge underdog in that fight, and I think that him winning the title was super emotional for him. And... Uh, once he got time to get back and let it sink in and he showed up to the press conference, he was Sean Strickland again. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it was, a, it was a cool moment for him. 
we realize that no matter how crazy he talks and all the things that he says, all the hard work and dedication he put into this sport, you know, he reached it that night. He, 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 he did what nobody thought he could do. The odds makers had him a 7-1 to one underdog. He went out and he did it. And, you know, even when you're sitting there, um, I'm sure he was sitting there waiting for this, you know, am I going to get fucked by the judges? Are they going to give it to Izzy? We're, we're in Australia. And once it came out that he was the winner and he was the new world champion, you know, we all saw a side to him that we'd never seen before. It was, it was cool. And on that note, do you think that maybe there's too much attention being paid to Izzy's poor performance and not enough towards Sean's good performance? No, I think there's, there's two sides. So that, listen, Izzy did not look good that night. He looked slow. He looked lethargic. He looked whatever. And, you know, what, what a lot of people are saying, that's right, but uh, Strickland felt it, knew it, stayed right in his face, and went after it. And, and you, like I was just telling, uh, you know, him earlier, it, it, it's like he fucking felt it. And he couldn't wait to get back out of that corner to get back in there and, and win that title. And I've got to ask a McGregor question. I'm sure you're sick and tired of answering these questions. But, but here's the other thing, too. When you have a, when you have a champion that's been as, as dominant and as good as Israel has, it's normal to, 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 when they lose to say, wow, he didn't look right tonight and all that good shit. Conor McGregor. Um, he called out Alexander Volkanovsky, and he also said he'd like to fight at 185. I'm wondering which one of those <laughs> options is more likely to happen. <laughs> I have no clue. I have no clue. We'll, we'll see. Listen, when, when Connor is back and we announce that Connor is fighting, we'll look at the landscape, see who's around, what's going on, and we'll figure out who he's going to fight next. So are you saying it's probably maybe not? I'm not saying a fucking thing because every jackass fucking website will be writing dumb shit tomorrow that I didn't say as usual. Thank you. Yep. Dean, I just got one. If we can get your thoughts on it. Epstein uh, Lawrence said something to ESPN today. He said, where we want to get is where every UFC fan is a WWE fan and every WWE fan is a UFC fan. Do you see similarities in the fan base and how achievable is that goal? <laughs> Lawrence, I love you. One of the dumbest statements of all time. Yeah, I, I don't know why he said that. Um, I don't even know what to say to that. No. There's no, there's some crossover. Some people like WWE, some people like UF, some people like both. There, I don't think there's ever going to be a day where we turn every UFC fan into a WWE fan or every WWE fan. What, what's beautiful about the synergy between these two fan bases is they are very completely opposite. You know, there's very little crossover. And uh, again, I, maybe he was misquoted. I hope that's the case, because uh, I could not disagree with him more. Yeah. Over here? Yep. We've seen fighters make two appearances on the contender series before, but it's pretty rare when we see guys make three appearances. After seeing what Stephen Gwynn did tonight, what do, you, what do you make of that? I mean, he overcame a bunch of struggles, I'm sure, to get to this point and finally get that UFC contract. You know, when you're, you know, anything in life, but especially in sports, when you can overcome adversity and, and stay focused and, and uh, keep your eye on the prize and what it is you want and you're talented enough, you can be him tonight. So I, I, I love that stuff and, and I'm really happy for him and uh, that's what this show is all about. Yeah, and uh, I know you touched up on this a bit after the fights in Australia, but Laura Senko made history at UFC 293, becoming the first female in the modern era to be part of the UFC pay-per-view commentary team. How was it like being seeing the progress she has made throughout the years and as she made her way up to this, and how was that achievement like? For the Laura, Laura's a beast. So if you took what you just said about Steven and applied it to Laura, you know what I mean? She has worked so hard. Um, I, I say this all the time. The key to being successful in life is knowing what you want to do. Once you know who you are and you know exactly what it is you want to do, you get up every day and you grind until you get it. And she is the perfect example of that. And uh, what, what she's done in such a short amount of time is amazing. And uh, yeah, she's so talented. I was talking to uh, – DC flew home with me today. So we were talking on the plane and he was talking about how, you know, 
his first time showing up to the Contender Series, he wasn't as prepared as he probably should have been, and how Laura was just crushing him in, in the meeting for, for, you know, running circles around him. She knew everything about every kid here, and she watched every single fight that you could watch on all the kids that were on the card. And she's just, you know, she's a true professional. She knows, she's like the Ronda Rousey, you know, of commentating. She knows she's first. She knows she's carrying the banner for women to, to, to break into this role. And she's doing everything she can to make sure that, uh, you know, she always is the best that she can possibly be. Would you say she's like the, one of the future stables of a UFC pay-per-view commentary team? Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about it. She's, she's an absolute pro and a beast. Awesome. And uh, I had a question about UFC 295. I mean, looks like we're still waiting on that co-main update. Do you have an update on that? Yeah, I, I didn't get to do shit today. I, I got home and had a bunch of other stuff fly at me, so we didn't even get to do matchmaking today. So I barely got here on time. But, uh, yeah, nothing yet. You think it's still looking like Edwards and Covington? or? Oh, I don't know yet. I'll, I'll let you know as soon as I know. If it was that easy, I'd just fucking announce it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Dana, right over here. Uh, Dana, I was wondering, as a Vegas local, as someone who run, runs a sports company, I just wanted your reaction to what's going on. A lot of the casinos, you can't bet. A bunch of machines are down. Just what's your reaction to seeing it happen in the city? Oh, I didn't even know that. Why? What's wrong? Cyber attack. Huh? Cyber attack? Yeah. On MGM? Yeah, like room keys not working because, yeah, a bunch of games. games not working. I had no idea. I've been kind of busy lately. I, I haven't been paying attention <laughs> to other guys' businesses. But, yeah, that, uh, that's, that's weird. And then I want to ask Alexa Grasso, obviously fighting this Saturday. She had talked about it. She hopes the Independence Day card becomes an annual thing. Obviously, fans are still hoping for an event in Mexico. I just want to know, you know, Fans will say, hey, not as many Mexican champions. Is it still a priority to the UFC? Just what is your response about going back to the market and, you know, just that for those fans? I would say that those fans that are saying that must not be reading or listening to anything that I'm saying. I've been beaten uh, the, the, the Mexico drum now for, for months. I literally switched everything around so that we could do this fight on Mexican Independence Day. Um, we're opening a PI in Mexico City, for those of you that didn't know that and haven't heard. And uh, I'm planning on going to Mexico City here soon and, uh, you know, for the grand opening. And then, yeah, doing an event in Mexico City also soon, I hope. Thank you. Yeah. I could not be more invested in Mexico than I am right now. Dana, over here. Yep. Uh, just to go off of the Noche UFC and Alexa Grasso, uh, in her rematch with Valentina Shevchenko, just kind of curious your thoughts on this rematch, how it might be different, your excitement level for a fight of this magnitude coming up this weekend. What's the question? Just your thoughts on kind of the main event this week. Uh, well, I love it. I made it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, how different it might be. You know? It's a very unique rematch, Valentina. Coming yeah. Up first loss uh, you, you're talking about... The number one pound-for-pound pound fighter in the world for females, uh, the first ever female Mexican world champion, taking on the not not the one of the greatest female fighters ever, one of the greatest fighters of all time. She already beat her once, so the rematch is fucking awesome and 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 very exciting for that division, and obviously very exciting for Mexico. I mean, I think it does speak a lot about the division, how far it's come in the last couple of years. You know, maybe start off a little bit slow, but I'm curious where you would rank flyweight for the women right now amongst, you know, the women's divisions you have. Do you think it's become the best one at this point? Th that what? The flyweight division in the, for the women, if it's become the best out of the women's division. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many good fights coming up in that division right now. I mean, realistically, if you, if you look at all the divisions right now, there's some good fights. Okay, there's a lot of good stuff. We were just going through matchmaking. I said this recently, but... Uh, and every year I go, holy shit, how are we going to beat this year? And then as we start planning out the end of the year going into next year, it's like, here we go again. So, yeah, it's awesome. Definitely. And uh, I just want to ask one thing about Power Slap, too, just because I know things are looking real good. You're really happy with it. But I'm curious, you know, when you look ahead, like, you get all these detractors, people saying it sucks or whatever. Or yeah. Like, just they said the same shit about the UFC, too. Well, that's why I'm curious, like, what exactly you see the longevity of Power Slab being? Yeah. This, this thing's so big, it, it's fucking bananas. Uh, I mean, I could throw so much shit at you 
that, that on how I've never been a part of something so successful in such a short amount of time. And all the other stuff that we're working on right now, sanctioning, you know, all these states are going to start opening up and sanctioning, and then we'll start taking it on the road and doing live gates. Um, it's a global sport in seven months. The numbers that we're pulling out of these other countries, uh, we're working on season two right now, and we got some, some fun guys coming in from around the world for season two. We're working on uh, where we're doing season three. Uh, the video game was the biggest, uh, you know, test that the company had ever done, and they do all the online video games, doing 60,000 downloads a day. Um, sponsorship off the charts, and the list goes on and on and on. It's, it's actually been really fun for me. All right, cool. Thanks, Dana. Thanks. Hey, Dana. Hi. Yep. Um, with the formation of TKO, um, Stephanie McMahon said last year that WWE was looking at boxing. You've dabbled with the idea before. Is there room in the organization for uh, a boxing company? Yeah. Is it, is it one you would create or one that TKO would look to buy an existing company? I would create. Could you elaborate? Huh? Could you elaborate? No. <laughs> with with um, the, you've got a show on September 16th, so like Mexican Independence Day and Cinco de Mayo are so closely associated with, with boxing and Mexican fighters and Floyd Mayweather. Can we see that going forward where UFC is going head to head with boxing for these key dates in the calendar? Because TGB promotions and Premier Boxing Champions did have that date at the T-Mobile Arena, but they've now gone to September 30th for the Canelo Jamel Charlo event. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for the last however many years, you know, sometimes we end up battling over the same dates, but it, it always works out. It's not like there's going to be any, you know, listen, we go pretty much every Saturday. So we're going to run into other things. Sure. Uh, one more on Sean Strickland. It looked like he put out a video where he might have already broken the UFC belt and he was putting it back together with duct tape. Had you seen that? I have not. <laughs> Plan on seeing lots of things over the next several months, though. Enjoy. Thank you. Dana? Yeah. Um, can you share what you, uh, you, you went back and talked with uh, Casey Tanner and, and AJ Cunningham. Obviously, you, you gave them their win money, but can you share what you told them? Just respect, man. So much respect. And, and uh, you know how I feel about this show. And you know how I feel about the matchmaking of this show. And when, when these guys show up and, and just do what these kids did tonight, it's fucking awesome. I, I, I just... I mean, I thought tonight was the first night that I've ever walked up into the octagon during the Contender Series. Apparently, Little Miss Know-It-All uh, said it was the second time that, that I've uh, done it. But, uh, yeah, it's I, I love this shit. Love it. Uh, Sean Strickland's post-fight interview got 2.6 million views, which is one of the largest it's in, in, in quite some time. What do you think that is? Is it just people wondering what the hell he's going to say, or is it just the, the star power? 2.6 million views on what? On uh, YouTube, his, uh, Sean Strickland's post-fight interview. His Octagon interview. Yeah. Let me tell you this. So on Instagram, I have 8.3 million followers. Um, me wrapping the belt on him did 16 million views. Yeah, so uh, DC was telling me on the flight back, he did interviews with him on his... Uh, on his YouTube channel, and it was the biggest he's ever done or something like that. And, yeah, if you, if you saw, you know, there was a lot of hype around Strickland early. He lost a couple, hype kind of died down, he came back, and he won the world title, and people are fascinated again. Do you think it's just people are wondering what the hell is going to come out of his mouth, or is it star power? I don't or? know. I just think, I, I think, uh, I think people love an underdog. He was such a big underdog in that fight. He came out and won, and, you know, like she was saying earlier, uh, you know, people are like, oh, don't take away the fact that, he, that, that Strickland won the fight. And, yeah, good for him. I love that shit. I, I, love, I love the support he's getting. It's, it's great. Um, were you surprised that Israel Adesanya didn't speak at the press conference? He came in, said something, and then dipped? Yeah, so I asked him. I told you guys that night. I asked him in Octagon. I said, you okay? He said, I'll talk to you later. I bumped into him in the back, and he told me about as much as he told you. So, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was strange. 
And then finally, uh, was there any communication to try and get Cain Velasquez at the event this this weekend? Was there any what? Was there any communication of trying to get Cain Velasquez at the Noche UFC event this weekend? Um, I don't think so. Cain was in town. We just shot something recently, and he was here. I don't know if he's still here. Yeah, I have no idea. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you have seen those. Well, well, look who flew in yeah, for the contender I, series. Yeah, I'm actually leaving right afterwards. I have hell yeah. Tonight. Um, in terms of UFC Noche, is that going to be an annual event? Like, are you going to book the, the arena uh, every year for uh, that particular date? Well, the question is, do we continue to do that date? Do we do Cinco de Mayo? Do we bounce around? I, I don't know yet. This, you know, this is our first one. Um, we'll see how this year plays out uh, as far as Mexico goes. And uh, I don't know. We'll go from there. Have you heard anything in terms of people coming in for the event from Mexico? Have I heard that people? Like, like in terms of the numbers, like it, um, is it going to be a, a massive amount of people that are coming in specifically for the event? I have no idea. I would assume that there are lots of Mexicans coming to the, to the, to the, uh, to the event on the, uh, you know. Yeah, I would imagine. I don't, have a, I don't have a tally of how many are coming over to see the fight, though. You guys keep good metrics. Uh, la and last one for you. You mentioned kickboxing and kickboxers coming over um, to do MMA because there's more money and more lucrative. Every time you come up with you know, doing boxing events, why not just go right into kickboxing? There seems to be much less of a barrier of entry here in North America. And we often see fans, you know, and there's a lot of grappling involved in MMA. They, they kind of rip it and they want to see action fights and striking. And when you watch glory kickboxing, K1, like the, the action is unreal. Why not delve into that area where there's, again, a bit less of a barrier of entry, less sanctions, et cetera? It never worked. Never worked. For whatever reason, kickboxing never worked. So when I, back in the 80s when I was a kid, I was a huge boxing fan, and kickboxing used to be on ESPN. They used to call it the kick of the 80s, and, and then it was going to be the something of the 90s, and then we went into the 2000s, and, you know, it never took off. Tell me the last time you saw a big kickboxing match, and there's been plenty of big fights with big kickboxers that's pulled big gates and the world cared and everybody wanted to tune in. It's never happened since the 80s. Yeah, just in the Netherlands, they have the big events every one huh? big event every. In the Netherlands, they have Glory Collision it seems to do really well, but I just feel like it, it has never really been properly promoted in North How America. well, though? I, lots, of, lots of guys tried to do it, lots of people. It was on ESPN. When ESPN was the biggest fucking most powerful, you know, sports network on cable and, you know, it didn't have all the competition that it has now and it, it just never worked. And, and, and yeah, I, I know it's, it's like saying, you know, when you say, oh, it, was, it did well in the Netherlands, it's like saying Muay Thai did great in Thailand. It's, it's like, you know, okay, but it doesn't, it doesn't translate to the rest of the world. That's it for me. You guys done with me? Have a good night.